Welcome to Swipe for More, the podcast for media and communication students exploring key media issues to help you swipe your way to success. This is our second episode, but if you're new here, welcome. We're four budding media and communication students studying at QUT. As part of Media Map Brisbane, we contributed our insights and views to this podcast, Swipe for More, where we delve into the themes and issues in the media world we've all heard of but want to dissect and learn more from. My name is Louise and I'm back here with Julia, Elizabeth and Taylor. And right now we're in the thick of federal election, federal election pandemonium. So today's episode is going to be about all things politics and social media. We promise not to bore you, but before we jump into that, let's talk about what we've been swiping right on this week. Taylor, what have you been swiping right? Well, it's been a week now, but I promise no spoilers. I saw Endgame a week ago. Has anyone else seen that? Yes, no. I did. I saw it opening day. Oh. Yes. I had to see it opening day because I was not having a part, any part of those spoilers. <laughs> but since then, I've noticed there hasn't actually been much big spoilers. Their anti-spoiler campaign kind of worked, but what I've been seeing is heaps of those out-of-context spoilers. Mm, yeah. You know what I mean? yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I keep seeing them. in those and they got really mad at me. <laughs> I, like, I don't want any spoilers. <laughs> See, I was going to ask you out of context. That. Like, but I still think they're spoilers, personally. Well, yeah, that's what they yeah. said. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it clues you into something, at least. Like, I probably mm. would have sat there the whole time going... What does this Do out of context <laughs> spoiler mean? Just exactly. sitting there waiting for it. But I'm going to see it on Monday and I know that that's what I'm going to do. I can just see the meme in my head and I'm going to be like, where's the out of context spoilers? <laughs> but, yeah. Right. Well, I have actually been swiping right on Eurovision. Mm-hmm. Oh, right. I used to be like a big fan when I was quite younger and then I sort of neglected it for a bit. But then I saw... Kate Miller Heidke is representing Australia. I still don't know why we're in it, but we are. <laughs> and I listened to her song that she's going to be doing, and I like really didn't like it at first. But then when you listen to it a few times, it really grew on me. And I'm actually re- like, I'm going to watch it now because I'm just excited to see how we do. I really think we could like place quite high. And um, so, yeah, and it's the 64th Eurovision contest Mm. and it's being held in Israel and it's happening the same weekend as the federal election. Whoa. So there'll be lots going on. Are we watching Eurovision? (laughs) 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 Yeah. So. Interesting to see the ratings for that I'm so keen for that now. Oh, great. Kate Miller Heidke, QT alumni. Exactly. Shout out. So, this morning when I was on the bus, I found this article about Instagram and how in Canada they're going to be trialling this thing where they do not display the amounts of likes photos are getting. So, like, they kind of, like, did some research and they found that they really wanted to just come back to their core, um, their core vision for their company, which is to be a social media company and not just like a popularity contest Mm. and so like the CEO said we are testing this because we want your followers to focus on the photos and videos you share not how many likes they get and I think that's such a cool thing that we're slowly moving away from the really in some cases really damaging parts of social media and moving into a more positive environment I Mm. like it it's really cool I wonder if it'll take off yeah, mm. and I wonder if they're trialling it in Canada because it's such a stereotypically nice yeah. place. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. If you don't even have cyberbullying. No. Everyone's nice to each other. It's all just maple syrup and pancakes. Mm. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so as we said earlier, we are in the midst of election campaigning at the moment. So what I've swiped around on this week was an article from the ABC that's gone through and it fact-checked the most recent debate between Bill Shorten and Scott Morrison, which I think happened on Monday. So I didn't actually watch the debate, but I thought this article was really cool because, like, obviously politicians can really say anything and not really be held accountable to it, yeah. especially in debates. Definitely. And so I thought it was, like, a cool democratic process that they've gone through and fact-checked everything, kind of showing the role that the media can play. Mm. And because I kind of have found that I'm not engaging in politics as much as I probably should be, especially as a media student. 
that something like that was a really cool resource to just go through and see what's happening. Have you guys been engaging much in the election? On the silence? Um, I've been trying to, but it's been mostly from pages I already like on Facebook, like mm-hmm. meme pages yeah. posting funny things about the election. But one thing I did do that, I did this when I first had to vote when I was like 18, you know that online quiz where it tells you like mm-hmm. what your view, what political mm-hmm. parties your views align with? I did that again. I'm like, maybe it's changed. It hasn't, but... Oh yeah, I did that when I first because that was like my first resource and is got, that I a think, legit thing it's on the yeah. end yeah it wow. goes through all the policies and kind of like sees where you range and i think yeah. you got like a hundred percent greens oh my <laughs> like, gosh. wow okay i did it and i got like 60 percent for everything or something stupid oh. like that and i was like well, who do i fight for oh, <laughs> um yeah it's very interesting. Yeah. But yeah, second federal election, is that for all of you as well, voting it? I think yes. so. Yes. Well, yes. Yeah. Still young. Yeah. Still <laughs> but, but a bit <laughs> where we align with. Yeah, definitely. So following on from that, we're going to be talking about the different affordances of social media and how they've kind of changed the political game and the political landscape. And from both perspectives, we're going to be looking at it from the voter side, our side, as well as how politicians use these affordances in both a good and bad way. You can kind of look at social media as almost a double-ended sword in that matter of politics. Like, there are good things and there are really bad things, depending on how you use it. But we've grown up in a unique way where we've experienced both sides of technology for a lot of parts, like... We remember before social media, we remember after social media, but with politics, we're kind of only on one side considering our age. Mm -hmm. So that's where the discussion's kind of going to be, how we see social media for politics. We're not going to be analysing campaigns or anything, don't worry about that. It's just (laughs) chatting about the way we see politics and social media and the way they work together. Because I'm sure we all remember Kevin Rudd Starting the whole social media oh political God, thing. Yes. Remember him playing handball with all yes, those primary school yes. kids? Kevin07. That yes. was the last yep. lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember there were like YouTube, like people made YouTube videos, like dressed up as Kevin and yeah. John Howard, like yeah. rap battles and stuff. <laughs> oh, I remember that. Oh, yeah. An nice. early YouTube yeah. Yeah. Right? Right? yeah. And then. It just sort of kept going from, I reckon, there. Well, that's mm. what I remember, and I'm sure yeah. you too. Because they're all, yeah. like, we're, like, all 20-something. Like, yeah. we're only new voters. Yeah. <laughs> we're still finding our way. Baby voters. <laughs> Baby voters. <laughs> it's kind of interesting, because we were talking about it before. No yeah. one had anything to say when we were talking about engagement with social media. Yeah. But even this is engaging with social media, is True. seeing all that stuff about Kevin 07 back in the day to what we're actually seeing now. Mm. Well, yeah, well, I'd say I'd get most of my political feed, I'm not really proud to say this, but from, like, Facebook. Yeah. And I also watch the ABC News at night, and that's about it for me. Mm. So, yeah, I think a lot of my... <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not proud of it, but I'd like to say a lot of my opinions are also just based on Facebook stuff, which probably... I haven't really checked credibility for, Mm -hmm. Um, but I'd say, yeah, if you're not a politician that's jumped onto social media, then you'll fall behind. Definitely. And I think because, like, I'm similar, like, I'll watch the news and I'll search for stuff, but when you're on social media, it's just right in front of you. It comes up naturally on your feed. You see it immediately. And because you are more surrounded by people who think similarly to you and the pages you choose to follow, I think that's where lines get a bit blurred because you are kind of only seeing selective discourse of politics on social Mm. media. That's true. In this, like, whole election, I feel like the only political advertising I've seen on social media have been from the pages that I actually follow. So I personally haven't seen anything from the Liberals except on TV in the rare occasion Mm. that I watch it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, like, like Julia said, for me, it's just so easy to get my information from Facebook and Instagram because I'm already there and I see an article, I click on it and I read it and, like, sometimes I don't even read it, I just read the headline and I get my information from that alone. And, like, sometimes you kind of have to remind yourself that 
politics actually is really important and we should probably stop ourselves and be like, wait, I should search this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so on all than, sides of the argument. Rather than, what fun. does BuzzFeed Oz tell me? <laughs> like, we all have to vote, so yeah. you kind of want to make it count and, like, actually put thought into it, mm. but... Yeah, sometimes it's a bit like... It seems overwhelming, I think. Overwhelming, yeah. Mm. Because policies and stuff, they're not really things that people teach you. No. Growing up, and, like, you can choose to pay attention to the news, or you could choose not to, but then you kind of turn 18, you're given the right to vote, and it's like, learn it all. And let's be real, it was a very, it's been a very long time since our grade 7 trip to Canberra, and they didn't teach us how to find political parties' views and stuff like that on social media back then. So, like, there's a lot that has, like, changed and, yeah. So would the first sort of affordance of social media to be discussed be interaction and involvement and how, like, politicians can sort of have that direct engagement with their Mm. citizens? Yeah, I think definitely. I think so. I think that's a really important one. Like, that obviously shows how much things have changed since, like, before social media and after social media is that one-on-one direct interaction. Yeah, it's really interesting. Like, even we have limited engagement among us, (laughs) it seems, but there are people who get fully engaged on social media. Like, Mm. now, I mean, the debate has been going on for who knows how long now, <laughs> but now people can actually get involved on Twitter. It's not yeah. just a one-way thing, people mm-hmm. watching them on TV. Like, so many people actually got involved on the debate on Twitter, which was, you only said the other day, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. And there's so many hashtags going around, people discussing it. It's really useful for people to be able to interact with people with the same views, see people with different views. And interact with the politicians themselves. Yeah. And it's sort of similar like that on Q&A as well. Yes, I was you legit can about to say tweet that. hashtag <laughs> Q&A and then mm. comes up on the screen or like sometimes do yeah. they respond to it? I think I, sometimes yeah. they do respond to some questions. But like what I remember of Q&A like ages ago when I was in primary school is that it was just the audience, like the studio audience that was just there. And they were the ones that asked the questions. But now it's just, it's opened up to, like, a whole world of millions of people that can now, like, Mm -hmm. obviously it's filtered by the producers and everything. But, like, that's an opportunity that we've never had before. I think that's so important because if you think about it, it's not just the people in that room that are voting. Yeah, exactly. And I'm pretty sure Q&A last year was the number one trending, number one hashtag in all of Australia. Mm. Which I think is cool to see because even though there's this kind of, you know, assumption that people don't really care about politics, like you just look at those kind of numbers. Yeah, the forums of discussion that come with the hashtags. People want to get involved. They want to learn. Which is another reason why I do, I think, I am drawn to getting my info from social media because half of it for me is reading the comments of what people say and, like, Mm. the top comments of, like, that article or something. I think everyone can sort of relate to that. And then I also sort of see what other people have to say and see if that affects my opinion. That's kind Mm. of where the bad end of social media and politics comes in, where people are getting their information from the wrong sources, and it's the wrong information. Yeah. That's so true, actually. It's like you shouldn't base your political (laughs) opinions on Karen, who lives in Bathurst. (laughs) Like, like, (laughs) what does she know? (laughs) I'm Um, sorry if Karen from Bathurst is listening (laughs) On a slightly more serious note, we have seen some interesting things come up on social media in the last 48 hours. So, as of time of recording, literally yesterday, we've had this Mm. drama with One Nation. One Nation. (laughs) One of their candidates, Steve Dixon, says some footage has been revealed of him with some strippers. And they're not nice images. And it's a very bad image. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a bit different it's, for One Nation. It's pretty rough considering One Nation's very... Um, very conservative. Conservative is the word I was looking for, yeah. Mm. Their um, views and stuff like that. Even considering their views, like, Pauline Hanson has been really upset by this whole mm. drama. And it's kind of... It's putting a lot of pressure on... Not just this, but 
The fact that you could be filmed or recorded at any time as a politician, basically nothing you do is safe unless maybe you're in your own home. So yeah. politicians with these affordances, they really need to be considering that kind of stuff, thinking about what they do, what they say all the time. And because of this scandal, people have come and dug up photos of other One Nation candidates, actually, the same party of inappropriate posts about women, photos with women. It's just all not nice, but in a way, I don't know, it's kind of a good thing that you're learning these things yeah, about your true. politicians. Yeah. yeah, freedom of press. <laughs> but it's just so funny that like they kept them up there. Like, I think if yeah. you were a politician and you knew the kind of media climate that you were working in, why would you have all these explicit images on your face? That's page? true. Like, you're going to get exposed. And, like, even your, like, if you have a private Facebook account and you've got your friends, like, they are still voters. Yeah. And so, mm-hmm. like, you, like, whether you like it or not, you are still supposed to be representing someone who is professional, not someone who's hanging out with strippers. Like, not that that in itself is a bad thing. It's more the fact that he's been so public about it and... He's framed himself, I think, as a family man with high family values. And then then we get this leaked footage of him saying derogatory things about strippers, really. Yeah. Which sort of... Which is important that we know now, Mm -hmm. I guess. And especially since this footage is very recent, like, it's within the last year since he has been a candidate, which has actually forced him to step down, which is really interesting. It's also kind of like, I read that Labour has actually banned their candidates from using their personal platforms for anything political. I feel like parties like Labour and Liberal National, they have to be a lot more pedantic about their yeah, they do. They do. Their candidates. There's yeah. probably a lot stricter rules. Mm. Well, mate, Barnaby Joyce yeah. <laughs> didn't really go down well No, either. No, it's a lot of trouble. But yeah. I remember seeing something that, like, in this day and age, Bob Hawke could never have been Prime Minister. Yeah. Just because even since he's not been Prime Minister, there's interesting footage of him emerging. Like, imagine the kind of stuff that would have happened while he was Prime Minister, if that had gotten out. Yeah, social media was so big. And I think another thing is, is, like, a lot of the time, stuff can have... um, Well, I'm not saying what the One Nation guys did is good. What I'm saying is sometimes um, things can be taken out of context and, like, violently out of context. Like, Clive Palmer speeches can be cut down to one sentences and then spread accordingly. Like, it just... Yeah, it's so hard mm. to really show your true intentions within the social media landscape. And I think that's why long-form media has gained a lot of popularity because yeah. when you try and watch stuff on the news, there's like, you know, 90 seconds to sort of fill everything in. You don't really get the full picture of what they're trying to say. Exactly. Which is why, I guess, like, Q&A or, like, different podcasts and stuff are picking up because people do want to are, I think, more interested now in, like, the hearing full their story. full explanation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then there's probably more than the other half of the population, though, that don't want to go to the effort of listening That's to all that true. and are literally hearing 10 seconds of Clive Palmer going... If you really want to have a, 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 a progressive country, you'd vote Green. Mm. Just wildly out of context. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I think what Clive has done really well is sort of shown a different side of his personality with his social media usage, which has been a massive distraction from his serious issues, like not paying these redundant workers at that nickel refinery. Yeah. And just, yeah, so he's sort of been using social media as, like, a massive distraction with all these sort of absurd correlations between Tim Tams and, like, Mm. chicken parmigiana and everything. (laughs) That's kind of... Yeah. It's kind of a weird thing, though, because you would expect that in the age of social media, politicians have to be more transparent, but Clive Palmer's kind of doing the opposite. He's kind of doing 
so much to cover up or yeah. prevent himself from having to be transparent. He's doing like this weird thing where it's he's being transparent, but it's about his eating habits and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, the things that people like, shouldn't care stuff about. Stuff that's completely irrelevant to yeah. the federal election. Eat pies, bring <laughs> yeah. yowies, and don't exactly, bring the green sort exactly. of. <laughs> but I think because we're so used to these like polished professional mm. kind of media personalities where they like know exactly what to say, they're just trying to get that right sound bite out there. That as soon yeah. as we see someone who's kind of using social media in an interesting way. People are really drawn to it, especially yeah. young people, because he yeah. is appealing to that whole kind of demographic. That's like the whole social media revolution that Kevin Rudd almost started. <laughs> like, he was literally named Twitter of the Year by news.com.au. Wow. That's, That's pretty impressive. Like, for an ex-Prime Minister, like... Go his, Kevin O'Sullivan. Yeah. Side note, that was a few years ago when oh, he was okay. still pretty relevant. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. it was still mm-hmm. a pretty big deal. Mm. Yeah. Well, I guess that is also something to consider, is that once upon a time, the only way you ever got to see what politicians had to sta- say is, like, through the TV, yeah. where it was you know, stage, they could rehearse what they had to say, but now with, like, so many different fragments and, like, different ways of viewing it, they have to be, like, that is something they have to deal with now is that they can't always get away with staging things and preparing things because they're a bit more caught off guard, would you say? And another thing is you've got to remember you've got stuff like Facebook live stream and Instagram live, which we were talking about before we started recording this podcast, but, like they could be in the middle of a Facebook live stream and whatever happens in that situation is out in the public forever. Like, Mm. (laughs) everybody knows. Like, you could accidentally slip up. Anything can happen and it's always going to be there. Yeah, I guess it really raises those, like, key things of authenticity and personality that Mm. in the social media era have become really important and we just kind of see them playing out more in politics now than ever before because politicians are trying to appeal to mass audiences through social media or just kind of use social media in a way that will benefit them. Mm. It's kind of interesting though because like there is that affordance of authenticity that social media provides and like Scott Morrison just made a Snapchat recently. Yeah. (laughs) And you would think that would be, like, a chatty, very, like, personal kind of thing, but the only way he's used it so far is to talk about the budget. Yeah, it's not really serving the right purpose. Also, his bitmoji looks exactly like him. It's really (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think... Snapchat is a strange platform, like, from a completely media perspective. Snapchat is a really strange platform for a politician to adopt because it's, mm. it's very, like, instant messaging-based. Mm. It's not like Instagram, Facebook and Twitter where you just post something and anyone and everyone can see if you said it that way. It's more like, you know, it's based off private photos that you send mm. to people. And I don't know anybody who still uses Snapchat stories, so I'm a bit confused what he's right, doing it's like there. He's trying to appeal to a young demographic, but like, but no one like go to I, Instagram and use stories there. Don't like, think anyone would pivot. want to follow him yeah. on Snapchat. Yeah, because like, what would he post that's interesting to that demographic? Unless he really? was literally no. like showing his personal life <laughs> and not policy yeah. stuff, which but, he wouldn't do because he's yeah, the prime minister. I don't know. It just seems like an old guy trying to use a social media platform. It's like yeah, your dad exactly. trying to use yeah, social media. It's but very true. Using it wrong. God, imagine if Clive Palmer made a Snapchat. <laughs> uh, I would See, maybe. That would be entertaining. <laughs> See, yeah, and I think... he's funny. He has <laughs> positioned himself uniquely that he could totally do that. Yeah. Like, that would feel more authentic to him. Scott Morrison. Yeah, and like, yes, right. It feels a bit forced. Stay behind a desk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's too professional and, like really straightforward yeah. that it's like also because well, yeah. like he is the prime minister yeah. he's not just this like <laughs> eccentric millionaire he's mm, trying he's, it out. he's just yeah Cl- clive palmer kind of like already has a track record of using popular things well like yeah. his memes i'm not oh, saying they're clive. good but i'm saying they got him the right attention yeah mm-hmm. but i think another thing is is 
you got to remember that voters, you have to be 18 to vote. And, like, I don't know many people over the age of, say, 25 that are really into this meme culture and that really understand it. So it's kind of, to me, it's strange because I'm like, well, Clive, why are you going at such a small target yeah. audience that doesn't, like, stereotypically doesn't share your views? True. That's the but, thing yeah, that I, I find interesting is that, like, a lot of people will, li- like, he gets quite a lot of likes for his memes and, like, people will tag their mm. friends because it's like, oh, my God, Clive, what yeah. are you doing? Yeah. You're so weird. But... Like, and it's fun in that regard, but, like, no one's realistically... Like, I wouldn't vote for him. Like, I think his no. memes are funny. Yeah. But, like, but some of them are good. People could. Like, if you were entering, you know, the ballot, like, to go and vote, and all you kind of knew about politics was, oh, Clive Pine is funny on Facebook. Yeah. Like, that kind of could impact the way you vote. That's and definitely just true. It depends how much you engage with politics. Because I think when he went viral with his memes, that was before... In that gap where he wasn't in politics, that's when he was, like, making memes about Tim Tams yeah. and chicken yeah. palmies and all that stuff. But it's when he got back into politics that it kind of took a weird turn because that's when he made that group, the Palmy Army, <laughs> where people were meant to submit memes. But that group turned into this weird, racist, super-right yeah, group. Really. But those are the kind of people who would vote for him. Mm. So maybe it did draw the right some, attention. Yeah. In some weird backwards way that defies all marketing theories. <laughs> <laughs> so the virality kind of thing. Mm, definitely. Maybe work for him in a way. I don't think the actual voter statistics will show that. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> no, it's such a small mm, niche. That yeah. it, mm. if, it, if his memes do work, they're not, ben, real, they're not going to help though. And I think it goes back to what we were saying at the start, where, like, maybe to us it feels like his memes are kind of everywhere, but it is only because we're engaging in that Mm. kind of, you know, content that it becomes apparent to us. Whereas, like, someone else who probably has never engaged with that Mm. may have no clue that he's even going on this weird social media tangent. Or like him. Do you really think, like, our parents would know about all the memes he's making? They would probably Definitely more not. likely know about those weird face not Facebook ads, the actual television ads. That were being, yeah, that's true. I only know about because they were being thrashed during Married at First Sight. Yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh, they just poisoned it. <laughs> Good old maths. Were his ads on during maths? Yeah. Yes, like, they were. Yeah. Well. He oh my gosh. forked out for that because maths was the top show in Australia at the yeah. time, so it was the most expensive ad slot, and he was forking out for it every ad break. I read an article back in April, early April, and it said that, like, that this is before the election has even been called, and he had already spent $27 million on his, like, advertising campaign, which Ooh. is wild, considering he's just a small minor party and he's just the odds aren't really in his favor they are not they're not in that way he was engaging with the young people through memes and the older audiences that's true through (laughs) television he's kind of covering it all (laughs) and he's been in politics for like a long time like he was a member of the liberal party for ages like as in like a life member like you know how you can join Mm. as like a member not like a like as a, a PM. He's yeah, just, yeah, but like he's been involved with it for a good amount of time. So like I'm sure, yeah, I think, I don't know. Like he knows what he's doing. Maybe yeah. he's just had a brain snap. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we all know who he is. I mean, Gosh. kind of speaking of that, like his memes kind of let us knew, know who he is, but in That's a good true. way, whereas... I didn't know who Fraser Anning was until the Egg Boy debacle. Mm -hmm. And that was a really bad thing for him. It was, yeah. And, like, again, the the Egg Boy situation brings up more interesting things is that, like, I think, I genuinely believe that the Egg incident would not have happened, like, 20 years ago before social media was a thing. I think that social media has created this unique... um, this unique empowerment for people to act out and right. are obviously throwing an egg isn't like, you know, fantastic <laughs> political move, but it's still like, 
you know, it's something. They've it's done so something. True. Well, I, th- I think, like, the actual egg throwing part itself would definitely be, like, a historical thing. Yeah. It's like, people would, f- you know, throw fruit at people or whatever. But the fact that he was, like, filming it, mm. it had yeah, his egg in one yeah. hand, fine in the other. He wanted to get a covert. It was at a pref- press conference. They were filming it. And then just from there, everyone it knew about it and were painting streets exploded. in Melbourne. He came, out, <laughs> he came out in an interview saying that he didn't want the attention. It's like, why would you why film it? Why would you film it if he didn't want the attention? I mean, he probably thought, like, oh, this will be funny for my friends. Mm, and yeah. then yeah. didn't think about, like, the beast that social media has become where every person in Australia and beyond is seeing this video. Seen beyond. video. It was literally on John Oliver, which is mm. yeah. really big in the States. And his he, someone made a GoFundMe for him yes. to cover his legal fees, which yes. he didn't end up having to pay. And it raised $80,000, which apparently he ended up donating to the victims of the crisis. As he should. That's, it's yeah, just so that's good, good. Like, people focusing on the wrong part of the issue. Yeah, definitely. But I think also probably wouldn't have been picked up as much if, you know, Christchurch wasn't this massive tragedy and what Fraser Anning had said wasn't so awful. Mm. He kind of, like, villainised himself and so everyone was rooting for the egg boy and then the way it was shared through social media just became so much bigger than what it was meant to be. Yeah, it's like the Labors and Liberals are, like, bonded over the hate for Fraser Anning and the love for egg boy. Oh, yeah, yeah. he's milked that one. I think it was, yeah, perfect timing and everything aligned... And it just mm. went viral. Do we mm. think he was a plant? <laughs> plant. Oh, what? Like, what? Labour put him in as a plant. <laughs> Labour. Oh. oh. Yeah. That's a bit of a conspiracy. <laughs> it's kind of I feel like Clive Palmer would pull something <laughs> like that. But anyway. <laughs> there is Actually, like this yes. other interesting side to it, though. Like, we say, like, if it's not for social media, then Egg Boy wouldn't have been filming it and it wouldn't have been viral. But mm. also, if it wasn't for social media... Fraser Anning wouldn't have responded in the first place. Exactly, and people wouldn't have seen his press release because I think he did. He, he posted yeah. it on, on Snapchat, Twitter, Twitter, yeah. <laughs> um, and of course that went viral because everyone was exactly. like, "Oh my gosh, this crazy yeah. guy!" And then it just just things <sighs> happen so quickly. Yeah, and I think politicians just have this obligation now to comment on everything. everything. Yeah, it's like. The whole 24-7 news cycle, it just Mm. comes with this sense of immediacy. Yeah. And it's both... It's a good affordance and a bad affordance. Yeah. It can be a double-edged sword sometimes, I think. Yeah. So I guess what we've kind of discussed about politics does fall under the social media affordances, like interaction and involvement, the pressure to behave and watch what you say, personality, authenticity, memes and virality... And kind of the immediacy and twenty four seven news cycle that's be- that's happened because of social media, and I think the way that it's interacted with politics is that it's kind of become both a means to challenge and empower people and politicians to kind of act in accordance with these new media expectations. Yeah, and I think as media and communication students, and eventually like practitioners, we we really need to be prepared to um, be innovative within different platforms that arise because you never know what's going to be the next big thing. You never know what's going to be the next Instagram. So I think it's really important for us to really be aware of both the pros and the cons of each of the different platforms that we can really utilize. Yeah. Well, if you're listening to this before May 18th, 2019, (laughs) just want to send out a quick reminder for you all to actually educate yourselves throughout this week, take a quiz, look at a couple of policies, and make your vote count this weekend. Mm. I just think that's really important. And after you've voted, make sure you catch our next episode where we'll be discussing YouTube. Yeah. And shout outs of the week go to Ben, Callum, and Ellen. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. Bye.